Welcome back to MoVC Control Cabinet Products Basic to Intermediate Training. This is session 11 and also lab number 4. In our previous lab, we set up terminal control mode and we're going to continue in terminal control mode during this lab as we explore something very important. Now what we're learning today, which is ramps and stops, does not just apply to terminal control mode, it applies to all control modes. This is something that is broadly relevant to any VFD situation, but happily we can play with it early through terminal control mode. But be aware it's available in field bus control mode and in some of the really advanced control modes, including Movi kits. All right, a quick word about motors. This is an easy lab. It works with either motor type. As long as you got it set up correctly and working for terminal control mode, that's the last lab, lab three. It will work for this lab, so just keep on using it and you should be good. I'll be using an asynchronous motor for this lab. Actually, this will be the last lab that I'll use an asynchronous motor. So let's go ahead and move forward into the pre-lab instructions. I need to give you a fairly good foundation for you to understand ramps and stops, so this will take a little longer, but believe me, it is worth it. First of all, some terminology. Let's take that term acceleration. I'm sure you've heard it before. We use it in everyday life. And if you've taken any kind of technical class or a physics class, then you know its definition is this. This is what your physics teacher would tell you. And with previous SEW products, we use this term as well. Acceleration was any change in speed and or direction. That could mean either a speed up or a slow down or a change of direction or both. Now that's very counterintuitive to daily life, but if you've taken physics, you probably got over that. So that's how we used to define it with earlier products. But with MoVC, we kind of went with the idea, let's go with the everyday understanding of what it means. Let's define acceleration as an increase in speed and deceleration as a decrease in speed. It's a little simpler, it's a little more intuitive, and you're going to see those terms in Movi Suite not just ramp or acceleration like you saw in older products. We still do use the term ramp, however, so stay familiar with that. It simply means any acceleration or deceleration event, doesn't matter what kind. Any change of speed, either up, down, or directional change is some kind of a ramp. Another term that SCW Eurodrive uses a lot with its products is something called a travel diagram. This is a graph of speeds over a period of time. Not a graph of position, but a graph of the speeds at which something is moving graphed over time. I'll show you an example of this if this is a new idea to you. Let's take a very simple travel diagram to start with. We're going to take a hoist. A hoist can go up and down and that's it. Of course, it's going to go from the floor where it won't be moving at all. It'll accelerate, move up to the top and stop. And then, of course, it can do the reverse and come down. Let's take a very simple event first. We'll start with the case where the hoist is on the ground and stopped. Now, look at this graph closely. The x-axis, the horizontal axis, represents time. And the vertical axis, the y-axis, represents positive or negative speed. Right now, our speed is zero because nothing's moving, so the line is flat, and it progresses through time, however long it is before the hoist goes into motion. Now, we're going to look at the hoist just going up. We're not going to do an up-down here. So let's see what happens when you say, okay, time to go up. You push the button, the motor turns on, and you go through an acceleration period. This is a period where the speed goes from zero to some terminal speed. Not the top, just some terminal speed. And it takes maybe a few seconds to accelerate to that speed. Now, once it gets there, the speed stops changing. And so what happens is the line goes flat again. Doesn't mean the hoist is stopped. It just means the speed isn't changing. So it's constant for a while as the hoist continues to rise. And then eventually, as it nears the top, it's going to slow down in preparation for arriving. And so what will happen is we'll have a deceleration event where the speed falls over a period of time. And then eventually it falls to zero and we come to a stop hanging up in the air. Really simple. That's a travel diagram for a hoist going up. Very simple and straightforward, easy to understand. 
Just a reminder, this diagram does not show position. We're not looking at the position of the load, we're looking at the speed of the motor as it goes through this event that takes place from its stopped condition on the ground to its stopped condition in the air. Now let's make it a little more complicated. Let's go up and down. We'll start with the up. We've already covered that, so we'll just whiz through it here. So we go from stop to acceleration to a constant speed, then deceleration and then to stop hanging in the air. Now we're going to come down. So it's going to go like this. We're going to dip below the x-axis to the negative y-axis. We accelerate in the other direction. When we reach a constant speed, we continue lowering at that speed. As we near the floor, we decelerate, we slow down. And then finally, we come to stop as we touch the floor. And that's kind of the end of the travel diagram. So this travel diagram is a little more dimensional because we have two directions of motion, but it's the same basic principles. Now, ramps. What are ramps? Well, I said they're any kind of acceleration or deceleration event. Let's define them a little more formally. We're going to start by saying a ramp involves a speed change. In other words, we need to know what speed it started at and what speed it ended up at. So we calculate the difference between those two by subtracting them. Speed change is final speed minus initial speed. If you took a physics class, you remember the term delta, which refers to changes. That's what this is. It's a delta, specifically involving speed. This travel diagram has two ramps. It has two places where the speed changes. The speed changes between 3000 RPM and 250. Remember, speeds don't always have to start from zero. They can change from an existing speed to another. And that is what is happening here. We're going from 250, a fairly low speed, up to 3000, a much higher speed. That's the change. And we can calculate it by subtracting it. And the total speed change is 2750 RPM. Pretty straightforward, nothing too hard there. Now, ramps also take time. Those speeds don't happen instantly. They can't. We're dealing with things that may weigh vast amounts. You can't accelerate them or decelerate them on a dime. It could take seconds or even longer sometimes with something really massive. So we have times. In this case, we have two ramps. We have an up ramp and a down ramp. You can see the up ramp took longer. Maybe it took two seconds. The down ramp was quicker. It took only one. So that's all the information we need to define a ramp, the speed change and how much time it took. And that leads us to a little math. Let's do some ramp calculations. Now, know this that Moby C by default specifies its ramps in RPM per second, revolutions per minute per second. And that's a really good ramp unit because it's something we can easily understand. It's how much we want that motor speed to change. And motor speeds are usually in RPM, so we're going to use RPM per second. Now, be aware MoVC does have the capabilities to handle user-defined units, which would include ramps, but we're not going to look at those here. We're just going to go with the default RPM per second. Let's look at some equations. Now, if you want to calculate how long a ramp time takes, what you need to know is the speed change in RPM and the ramp value in RPM per second. So for example, if I say that the ramp value is programmed in the VFD to 500 RPM per second, and you do a 1000 RPM speed change, for example, you go from zero to 1000 RPM or 1000 RPM to zero, it'll take two seconds. That formula tells us that. 1000 RPM, the speed change divided by 500 RPM per second, the ramp value, it equals two seconds. Really easy. All right, that's fine. What if you don't know those two values? Maybe you want to figure out what kind of ramp you need to program in the VFD for a given speed change and desired ramp. Well, there's another equation. It's just the same one rearranged with some algebra. If you want to know the ramp value to program into the VFD, take the speed change you're proposing to do and divide it by the ramp time you wish it to take. So if you want to do an 1800 RPM speed change in half a second, Set the ramp value to 3600 RPM per second. Take 1800 RPM, divide by 0.5 seconds, and there you go, 3600 RPM per second. It's really simple.
All right, and that transitions us now to a related topic, and that is called stop types. MoVC can stop itself in a number of different ways, and these handle different situations, ranging from deadly emergencies where you have to stop just as fast as possible to just ordinary stops where you come to the end of a particular motion or kind of travel. There are different types, and they work different ways, and they each have their own ramps, so they can work at different speeds. That's the important idea, and where they tie into ramps. So we're going to go through the different stop types so you understand them and where they get their control information, how they behave. We're going to start with one called an immediate stop. This one is kind of often used in emergencies. And here's what happens when you ask for an immediate stop. The VFD cuts power to the transistors, the output stage. So basically that motor just loses energy right away. Now, if a brake is available on the motor, the VFD will try to apply it. Now, if you have a motor without a brake, guess what? The drive can just start coasting on its momentum. So it won't necessarily stop. It depends. If you really need it to stop, you need to have a brake because the VFD is not going to stop it. It's just cutting power to it. We call this kind of stop, even though it's immediate, an uncontrolled stop, because if there's no brake, you can't really predict how long it's going to take to stop. The stop speed is unknown. It depends on the presence or absence of a brake and the size of the load and also the configuration of the application. But it is one type of stop available. Now, what invokes it? The most common thing to invoke it is the controller inhibit signal. If you turn controller inhibit off, you'll get an immediate stop. You can also trigger it over the field bus. There is a software equivalent of it. It's a bit that you transmit through the field bus. It's called Active Output Stage Inhibit. I've shown you an example of it right down there. If you send that bit over the field bus, you'll get an immediate stop. Next type of stop is called the emergency stop. This is similar to an immediate stop in that it's used for really important things, but it behaves quite differently. Instead of just cutting power, it does a controlled ramp to a stop using a dedicated set point, which I've shown you right here. It's set to 3000 RPM per second. So it's trying to bring the VFD to a predictable stop. Stop speed is predictable with the emergency stop under normal conditions. If everything's working right, you can know how long it takes. It does the ramp first, then it cuts power to the VFD's output stage, then it applies the brake if it's there, so that is a little different. Now, you can invoke an emergency stop in multiple ways. You can associate it with a fault of some type. And I've given you an example here with limit switches, but there are many others. You can also trigger it over the field bus. There is a bit called the emergency stop bit. And if you send that from a PLC, it will also trigger it. So that's our next type. That's our first controlled stop. Then there is an application stop. You ramp to a stop using a dedicated limit value, which you program in through Moby Suite as a parameter. Otherwise, it's a lot like the emergency stop. It deliberately ramps to a stop using the dedicated ramp. It cuts the power to the VFD. It applies the brake if present, and that's it. You can also use the application stop with faults if you wish. You can configure it that way. You can trigger it over a field bus by sending the application stop bit. Let me just warn you that this controlled stop that does have predictable speed can become the default stop ramp if you set your configuration up a certain way. Or if you set it up a wrong way, this is often the fallback one that gets used. So if you keep seeing the application stop and that's not what you want, you probably have something set up wrong. So be aware of that. And then there's the last kind, the normal stop. This is what you just use for ordinary operations where nothing is wrong. It ramps to a stop using either set points set up in Movi Suite or over the field bus. You can transmit a ramp value over the field bus through a process data word. There are lots of possibilities here, and I've shown you some places where there are normal ramp set points that you can pick, for example, in jog mode. Once the ramp is over, what happens depends how you've configured the VFD. You don't automatically have the output stage shut off and the brake engage. They may or may not. It just depends how you've set things up. So this is a little more flexible. You can trigger this in many ways, for example, by clockwise or counterclockwise changing, by an FCB control signal going off. You can control it over the field bus with the start-stop with field bus ramp bit. 
there are many possibilities because this is used a lot. And so there are many ways to send it to the VFD. Four types of stops, immediate, emergency, application, and normal. And they all get their ramps from different places. So very flexible, but you've got to make sure you know what you're doing. All right, an important point. Stop ramp speeds must follow a hierarchy or they won't work as expected. In other words, the most emergency ones need to be the shortest or the fastest. So emergency stop needs to be the fastest, application should be a little slower, and normal stop the slowest. If you don't follow this hierarchy, then sometimes the system does some odd things. If you have an odd stop behavior, take a look at your different ramps. You may have violated the hierarchy here somehow. Okay, that was a lot of info and I'm sure you're champing at the bit to get to the lab. It is definitely a longer one because you're going to be doing more, but it's well worth it. It explains a lot of things. So pause the video, do the lab, and come back for the walkthrough. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that and found it interesting as you discovered there were some gotchas in there. And if they didn't make sense to you, watch the lab walkthrough carefully and I will explain them. Ramps are complicated. You'd think they aren't, but really they are. So here we go, we're doing the lab walkthrough. Okay, well, let's do a lab. I have my terminal control projects still loaded up. If you've come back after a break, be sure to load your project. You should be where you were when you finished the terminal control project. We're going to be going from there so all our previous settings are still in place. We're going to explore ramps and stops. This is a surprisingly complex lab. You wouldn't think it would be, but it is. You'll have to do a small amount of math in this. I am going to show you answers so you know what the correct values were. If you are uncertain about the formulas, I urge you to go and review the earlier part of this video because everything you need is there. All right, let's go. First thing we need to do is configure our drive to allow us to play with ramps. We're going to play with jogging ramps first, so we're going to need to reassign some IO signals. I'll go ahead and click the inputs and outputs shortcut and I'm going to change the inputs and outputs as the instructions specify. Okay, so what I've done, I've just set up jog mode. DI01 activates the FCB. DI02 and 3 control the direction, and DI04 controls the two jog speeds. Nothing complicated here. You've seen this before. We do need to go configure the FCB itself, so let's jump to drive functions and pick FCB20, which is jog mode, and it happens to be already selected. I want to set my speed set points to something different. I'm going to use 300 for the lower jog speed, and I'm going to use 300 in both directions, and I'm going to use 900 for the higher speed. I'm also going to do something else. I'm going to change the ramp. I'm going to change these to some rather ridiculous values Right now they're set to 3000 RPM per second, which is a typical kind of ramp, but I'm going to set the acceleration ramp to a mere 300, and I'm going to set the deceleration to an even slower 30. Now, why have I picked such ridiculous numbers? It's very simple. This will allow you to see very clearly if the ramps are doing what they're supposed to, because these are values you can actually count how long it takes the drive to speed up and slow down. So I'm using deliberately exaggerated ramps just to illustrate a point. Of course, every application has its own needs, so you would need to set these to whatever is appropriate to the real application. Okay, anyway, we're all configured and ready to go. Now we need to figure out how long it's actually going to take the drive to accelerate and decelerate at the two jog speeds with these two ramps. 
So step two in your lab instructions tell you to go out and calculate the acceleration times for the 300 RPM acceleration and 900, and then the deceleration for the 300 and the 900. Your speed change will always be from zero to 300 or 900 or from 300 or 900 back to zero. So speed change is easy, it's 300 or 900 and you've got your ramp values, so plug them into the equations, and these are the answers you should have gotten. If you didn't get these answers, go back and review the formulas earlier in this video. All right, we're now going to test our jog mode and see if we get these speeds. We should be able just to eyeball these speeds and see if we're getting them, because they're pretty slow. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be removing controller inhibit on the control box, with DI00, I'm going to be activating jog mode by turning on DI01, and then I'm going to pick a direction, DI02 or DI03, and I'll also be able to play with the speed by using DI04 to select between the two jog speeds. So I'm going to give this a try and see if I see a distinct difference in acceleration and deceleration for the two speeds. Let's give this a test. All right, I've picked clockwise and it's running. I'm going to stop it. I'll try counterclockwise. Stop it. All right, so I don't see much difference so far. I'm going to pick the other speed. I'll turn on DI04. And you know what? While it's working, I'm not seeing any real difference. Obviously, it took a little longer to accelerate at the higher speed because it's got to go up to a higher speed, but I didn't feel any difference really happened. And guess what? There's a question to answer on your lab instructions, and it says, does the drive's behavior reflect the ramp settings? And the answer should be no, it doesn't. I'm getting basically one ramp speed all the time. Now, the question is why? We set everything correctly. What's going on? Well, I laid a trap for you, and you need to figure out how to fix it. But I'm going to give you a hint on this one, and then later you're going to have to solve this problem yourself. Notice there is a switch here. Profile values via profile value connection, and it is turned on. Remember I told you back when I explained about how FCBs work that you can create virtual wiring by turning switches on and off? Well, it turns out this switch is controlling where FCB20 is getting its ramps, and they are coming from somewhere else. So I'm going to turn this switch off, and I'm going to try things again and see if that fixed anything. So here we go. We're trying again clockwise and shutting down. And yes, we're definitely seeing a difference now. Yeah, that's right. It took about a second to accelerate and about 10 to decelerate. Let's try the other direction. Okay, yeah, that's definitely working now. All right, let's try the higher speed. Once we come to a stop. Yeah. All right, and yeah, that's taking a very long time to decelerate. I think we've got that 30 seconds. I'm not gonna make you sit through another 30 seconds by doing counterclockwise. I think we've got it. So very clearly that switch is important. That changed where the ramps came from. Now the question is, we know how to control it now. We're now using the set points we programmed, but when that switch was on, where was it getting them? Was it just pulling them out of the ether or did they come from somewhere definite that you can know about and change? Well, let's find out. Let's go to monitoring functions and pick limit values. Remember we set the application limits when we commissioned the motor and we picked acceleration and deceleration values of 7,200 RPM per second. If you calculate that, by the way, and you're curious, that's about a quarter of a second ramp time. So. That's kind of suspiciously like what we were just seeing. As it turns out, the application limits had taken control when we had that switch in the one position. Now, maybe you want me to prove that? Okay, let's change these to something ridiculously slow, like 100. Go back to drive functions, 
turn that switch back on and see if now we get a very definite ramp value. All right, yeah. Notice now we're not getting that fast ramp anymore. Let's go for the high speed. Still taking a pretty leisurely time to accelerate and decelerate. Okay, so I think we figured it out. When that switch was in the one position, it was using the application limits, not the set points. So there's an example of that virtual wiring with FCBs. We had it pointing somewhere else and it was ignoring our set points. If this ever happens to you when you're working on something, pretty good chance it's defaulting to the application limits because you've got your wiring wrong. So it's usually a switch to flip or sometimes a process data word that you have to transmit. All right, so what we need to do is first of all, go back and change our limit values from these ridiculously slow values to their original values. Otherwise we're going to have some really funny ramps later on. So I've changed them back, but I think we've proved our point. Okay, well, we're making progress. Now what we need to do is explore how ramps work when you're kind of in just regular terminal control mode using those fixed set points. That's the most common way you do terminal control mode. Jogging was important, certainly. We understand it better now, but we need to look at our fixed set points and where they get their speeds. I've jumped back to the I.O. screen because we need to configure our inputs and outputs differently. So I'm going to make some changes according to what the instructions told us to do. Okay, so here's what I've done. I've assigned DI01 to FCB05, that speed control. We just have to activate it by turning it on with that digital signal. I don't have to pick direction. I'm going to let the sign on the set points establish direction. DI02 is a new one. This allows me to choose between two separate ramps. When you're in fixed set point mode, you can actually have two different ramps that you can select with an IO signal. This allows you some additional flexibility. We're going to explore that. And then DI03 through DI05, I have associated with the three bits that select the six set points by putting in a binary number 001 through 110. Nothing too complicated here. I do need to set up my set points and ramps though. So I'm now going to move on to set points and I'm going to pick fixed set points. I'm going to leave it in bipolar fixed set point mode. I'm actually not going to use both directions. I'm just going to use clockwise directions. So all my set points will have positive signs on them, but I do need to set up my set points. I'm supposed to do 250, 500, 750, 1000, 1250, and 1500. So let me just go ahead and quickly key all those in. There we go. All right, that's set up. Now I need to set up my ramps. And I do that right here where it says acceleration and deceleration. Notice there are two values, acceleration one, acceleration two, deceleration one, deceleration two. I'm going to set these up to 750 and 500 for my acceleration ramps. And my deceleration ramps, I'm going to set to 375 and 250. Again, I'm picking very slow values just so you can see the differences in speeds. I'm also going to point something else out. Notice in the drivetrain two column, it doesn't say revolution per minute per second. It says UMDR minute second. 
Let me explain that. That's a bit of German that's still working in this version of Movi Suite. UMDR, if you look it up, you'll find out in German it means RPM. So remember I told you sometimes you see bits of German floating around in our products. There's an example. Don't let that throw you. Obviously, whoever translated this screen forgot about Drivetrain 2 and left it in German. All right, no harm done. Let's move on. Now we have sort of a little spreadsheet kind of thing we have to calculate to get all those ramps. I look at this now and say, when I wrote this lab, why on earth did I make them do so many calculations? It's kind of a pain. The reason is it gives me a chance when I'm teaching this as a live class to take a break while all the students are doing the math. So you're going to have to go and do this, but I'm going to cheat here and just pop up a spreadsheet showing you all the different times you notice that at the low speed, it takes a very short time, about a third of a second to accelerate. At the highest speed, with the second acceleration, it takes a full three seconds. And deceleration goes from two-thirds of a second on the first value and the lowest speed to a full six seconds on the highest. This is going to definitely show some differences if everything's working. So what we're going to do is we're supposed to test it at every single speed and every single acceleration. I'm going to start this and see what happens, but if I notice that things aren't changing much, I'm not gonna go through all of these. I hope you did, that's what a good student does, but I'm a lazy teacher today, so I'm not gonna do the full thing. But what I am going to do is fire up my drive so you can see it working. I'm also going back to inputs and outputs just so you can see what I'm flipping on the control box. I remove control or inhibit, I activate the FCB to get in speed control mode. And I'm going to use the lower acceleration here. What I'm gonna do is I'm just going to pick speed four as kind of a quick speed, that's a thousand RPM. And we're going to use that to watch everything and see if we see any changes. So I'm going to turn DI05 on, the drive accelerates. I'm going to now turn it off, it decelerates. All right, I'm not seeing a whole lot of difference. Let me try the other ramp. I'm going to turn DI02 on. That should give me a different ramp. We should get two and four seconds. Let's see if we do. You know what? We're getting exactly the same speed. There is no change going on. Now, to be thorough, I should test everything, but as I said, I'm being lazy today, so I'm not. So I'm gonna just shut this off, turn everything off, and we've gotta figure out what's going on. Obviously, I've laid another trap for you. The drive is certainly not reflecting the ramp settings. So we need to figure out where the virtual wiring is wrong. And my guess is that it's that application limit that's taking over again. So we need to figure out how to change it. I've told you go hunting and try to figure out where the switch is. And I said, hint, it's under the set points menu. All right, well, I hope you kind of figured out that there's something called profile value connection here, another submenu, and that's sort of similar name to what we saw with the jog mode when we had trouble. So I really hope you found this. And bingo, here we go, profile values, maximum acceleration, maximum deceleration. It is set to the application limits. Now you may wonder why is it showing 2000 RPM per second, not 7200? That is because I am operating my VFD on a transformer and I have to use a slightly lower application limit so it doesn't fault. It's a trick I'm doing. I'm recording this one actually away from the office where I don't have 480. I'm using a transformer that steps up my voltage, which explains why I have the funny application limit. But you can see, aside from that, that it's going to the application limit for the ramp values so I need to get in here and change something, and this looks like a very good choice, pick fixed set points. So I'm gonna change both of these to fixed set points, and I'm gonna go back to IO, and let's see if now we have made a change. Here we go again, we're going to use 1000 RPM. We should see acceleration of about one and a third seconds and two and two thirds deceleration, and then two seconds and four seconds with the other ramp. Let's see if we get that. Acceleration, deceleration, definitely different this time. Let's try the other ramp. Yeah, I think we've got it now. 
that looked to me like about one and a third, two and two thirds, two seconds, and four seconds. It looks like once again, we got zapped by the wrong internal wiring. Be aware of these little things here. There are some sneaky gotchas hiding in Movi Suite, and it all comes down to how your FCBs are wired up. Okay, moving on now to our final activity within the lab. We need to make some changes to the I.O. system. What we're going to be doing is exploring some of the stop ramps, the application stop, the emergency stop, the normal stop. I need to reconfigure my I.O., so let's go ahead and do that, and then I'll explain to you the changes I've made. Let me explain the changes I've made. First of all, DI01 I've left assigned to FCB05 so I can invoke speed control. DI02 and DI03 I've assigned to hardware limit switches. These are very, very common in real applications where you have limit switches to make sure that you don't exceed the correct travel limits. You tap either one of them, it will fault the drive, bringing it to a halt. DI04, I've assigned to external fault. This is just an input that would normally be connected to some kind of fault detecting sensor, so I've used that. And then DI05, I've left assigned to the fixed speed setpoint bit 2. With the other bits gone, I can't activate all six speeds, but with bit 2, I can pick one of the speeds, and for what we're doing here, that's fine. This will trigger the 1000 RPM speed, which is perfect. And then DI07 is new. I've assigned it to a signal called fault reset. If I turn DI07 on and then off, it will clear faults. So this is a way to clear faults apart from doing it in MoviSuite. In real world applications, this would be extremely useful actually to have a fault reset button or switch. Speaking of faults, maybe you notice that as soon as I assign those hardware limit switches, my drive faulted. I'll go up here and open the fault so we can see what it is. And big surprise, it's a limit switch fault. It indicates that I've tapped the positive limit switch. Of course, you can clear faults just by clicking the reset device fault button, but that's not going to work in this case because the limit switches are still triggering the fault. You may wonder why. Well, remember that discussion we had back in the terminal control lab about active high and active low signals? Well, limit switches and fault sensors are treated as active low devices. That means if they go low, they're indicating a fault. Again, that's that fail-safe concept that you want the system set up so if the wire gets cut or a power supply fails, you get a fault and the system stops, which is a safe thing to do. However, since I have all the switches on my control box turned off right now, both hardware limit switches and the external fault sensor are tripping faults right now. What I need to do is turn those three switches on, DI02, 3, and 4. Let me do that. Notice the fault hasn't actually gone away. I still have to clear it, but instead of doing it Movie Suite by popping open the error message, I'm going to do it with DI07 and see if that works. I'm going to turn that switch on and off. And guess what? It cleared the fault. Isn't that nice? All right, so we've taken care of that. We've got our IOs assigned. We've got our switches in the right positions. Now we need to go and set some ramps. I'm going to use kind of slow values so you can see how long the ramps take and even sort of count them. In real life, you would use relatively fast ramps for the emergency and application stops because you generally want them to stop fairly quickly, but we're going to go with slow values. I will go to monitoring functions, first of all, and set the application stops. I'm going to set acceleration to 1,000 and deceleration to 500. That will give me a relatively slow application stop. 
I'm now going over here to the emergency stop deceleration and set that to something a little quicker because emergency stops are supposed to be faster than application stops. I'll set it to 1,000. That takes care of the emergency stop. Finally, I need to set just a normal stop. And we're using fixed set points, so I'm going to go to my fixed set points submenu under set points, and I'm going to just set my deceleration to 250. That will be my slowest stop. So, in order priority, the emergency stop is 1000 RPM per second, the application stop is 500, and the normal stop is 250. I'm following that hierarchy of progressively slower ramps. So far, so good. The instructions ask you to calculate how long those ramps will take. I'm going to pop up a little spreadsheet here showing you those values. You can see the emergency stop should take one second, the application stop two seconds, and the normal stop four seconds. This, of course, is with a speed change of 1,000 RPM. We'll be going between zero and 1,000 RPM and then 1,000 RPM down to zero. Okay, no surprises there. The last thing we have to do before we can test everything out is make sure that the different ramps are triggered at the appropriate times by the appropriate sensors. Remember, we have limit switches and an external fault sensor. I'm going to go back to monitoring functions, and I'm going to pick the overview of fault responses submenu. This is where you assign things. So we're going to decide how everything works. Now the first thing we need to do is make sure those limit switches trigger an emergency stop. So I go up here to hardware limit switch hit response, and it's already set to emergency stop plus output stage inhibit. That's okay, so that one is set correctly. I then need to make sure that fault sensor is assigned to something, and I'm going to assign it to the application stop so we get a different ramp. And I go down here, response to external fault, and boy, it's done my work for me. It's already set to application stop and output stage inhibit. That's good. So the limit switches will trigger the fastest ramp, the fault sensor the next fastest, and then, of course, the normal stop will just stop in the ordinary way. I think we're finally ready to go ahead and test our drive. Here's what we're going to do. I've got my control box. Of course, I'm going to remove the controller inhibit signal. Now, I don't have all my set points, but if I just turn on that one single set point with DI05, that'll pick number four, which is 1,000 RPM. That's the value we had programmed into the fixed set point last time. That'll give us that speed response we want and then I'm going to trigger the different faults and we'll see how they behave. Okay, so here we are. Let's get the control box and get ready to go. Going back to my IO page so you can watch me operate the control box. So I'm going to remove control or inhibit. First thing I'm going to do is engage the speed control FCB. I'll turn on DI01 and we've switched to FCB05. I can see that my drive's display says 05 and so does MoviSuite. I'm going to turn on DI05 now, and I'm going to accelerate my drive. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is trigger a limit switch fault. That'll do the emergency stop ramp, which should take a second. I'm going to turn DI02 or 03 off. To trigger it, I'll use DI02. Here we go. And there, we got our emergency stop. It took a whole one second. Normally, an emergency stop might be faster, but you could at least count that and watch it go down. You also notice the drive is faulted. I've got that limit switch fault again. I can pop that up. What I'm going to do instead is clear it with DI07. Of course, I have to turn my limit switch back on, and I'm going to clear this. Notice my drive restarts immediately. Always be careful when you clear a fault because the drive can pick up where it left off and that can be dangerous, so always be safe there. All right, let's try the application stop by tripping the external fault sensor. DI04, I'll turn that off right now. And that took about two seconds, so that seems to be working as well. That's clearly the application stop. And of course, notice again, we do have a fault. I'll open this one up so you can see it. External fault, okay. Let's turn that signal back on, restart our drive with DI07. 
And the last thing we're going to do is a normal stop, and I'm going to do this just by turning DI05 off. That just says stop running at set point number four. And you can see that took about four seconds to come to a halt. Okay, so that's our hierarchy of stop ramps. Let me show you one other stop ramp and then we're done. Let me start the drive moving again. I'm going to trigger a controller inhibit stop by turning DI00 off and you'll notice something about it. It stopped really quickly. That's because my drive has a brake on it. Notice it actually kind of jumped when that happened. There's no ramp, so there was no way of predicting how fast that was. It happened to be very fast here because it's an unloaded demo unit with a brake on it. In a real world application with a big load, it could run for a while. But at any rate, you've seen now all four of the stops we've discussed. So there we are, we're at the end of our lab, and I hope you found that interesting and profitable. And that is the end of session 11. Good job for hanging in there. We're now finished with really our basic foundational knowledge and experience with OVC. We're now going to move on to a few other topics, but we're going to kind of give you an easy lab as our next one. We're going to play with a servo motor in what's called ELSM mode, and I think you'll find that interesting. So see you then.